Flexor tendon injuries. These are the topics we'll be talking about. Etiology and mechanism of injury. Anatomy of the tendons. The poly system. Nutrition and blood supply. Zones of injury. And the clinical presentation of flexor tendon injuries. The etiology, the flexor tendon injuries can imply that an injury to the flexor digitorum superficialis and profundus, one of them or both of them, is usually caused by a trauma or by laceration. When you have an open wound and a suspected tendon injury, then you need to explore the wound. So if you look at the wound and you find that the tendon is intact, it doesn't really mean the tendon is intact because the tendon moves. The position of the wrist and the fingers will change the level of the tendon that you are looking at. And this may not correspond to the site of the tendon injury due to change in the wrist and finger position. So you may think that you don't have a tendon laceration. You do, but you don't see it. So when you examine the wound, examine the wound with movement of the wrist and the fingers. Go through a range of passive and active movement to see if there is a tendon injury or not. Examine each tendon individually for injury that's caused by a laceration or by trauma. Another mechanism for the injury is forceful extension while the finger is actively flexing, like the jersey finger, for example. In the jersey finger, 75% involve the ring finger. Usually, there is minimal clinical symptoms. Get an x-ray to check for bony avulsions. The jersey finger has three types. Type 1 is important because the tendon retracts into the palm and you need to reinsert the tendon into the distal pharynx within 7 to 10 days to avoid contracture and necrosis of the tendon. Type 2 injuries is retracted into the PIP joint and can be inserted till 6 weeks. And type 3 from Liddy classification will involve a large bony fragment and that will block proximal retraction of the tendon at the A4 poly. And the A4 poly is present at the middle pharynx. The anatomy. There are two flexor tendons for each finger and one in the thumb. You have the flexor digitorum superficialis, which comes from the forearm and it is in the superficial layer in the forearm. And the flexor digitorum profundus, which comes from the forearm and it lies in the deep compartment in the forearm. And you have one tendon in the thumb, the flexor pollicis longus, and that lies in the deep compartment of the forearm. These tendons go through the carpal tunnel and then they travel into the site of their insertion. The flexor digitorum superficialis has four tendons and each tendon divides into two slips and is inserted into the middle pharynx and it flexes the PIP joint. The site of insertion of the flexor digitorum superficialis decides the deformity and the deforming forces in fractures of the middle pharynx. The deformity varies if the fracture is proximal or distal to the superficialis insertion. The superficialis is a flexor of the PIP joint it may assist in MCP flexion. 
The flexor digitorum superficialis is absent in the small finger in about 25% of the time. The innervation in the median nerve and in the carpal tunnel, the superficialis for the middle and the ring fingers are volar, as you can see here in this diagram. When multiple slips of the superficialis tendon are cut, identify the tendons properly. So the profundus is inserted into the base of the distal pharynx and it flexes the DIP joint. The medial half of the flexor digitorum profundus is supplied by the ulnar nerve and it flexes the ring and the small finger. If the patient suffers an ulnar nerve injury below the elbow, then the flexor digitorum profundus will be working, and the intrinsics of the fingers will not be working, and this causes clawing of the fourth and fifth fingers if the injury of the ulnar nerve is below the elbow. The lateral half of the profundus is for the index and the long finger and is supplied by the anterior interosseous nerve of the median nerve. If the anterior interosseous nerve is injured, the patient will not be able to do the OK sign because they cannot flex the DIP of the index finger or the IP of the thumb. The flexor pollicis longus is the most radial structure in the carpal tunnel, as you can see here, and it is innervated by the anterior osseous nerve. We have pulley system that keeps the tendon close to the bone and avoids both stringing of the flexor tendons. The most important two pulleys are A2 and A4, as you can see here in this diagram. The A1 pulley is the one we release for trigger finger. A2 and A4 are important pulleys, do not release. The thumb contains three pulleys. The oblique pulley is the most important pulley to prevent flexor tendon bow stringing. The A2 pulley is not significant. The A1 pulley is the one we release for trigger thumb. Nutrition and the blood supply. Diffusion through the synovial sheath occurs when the tendons are located within a sheath. Usually, that is distal to the MCP joint, and it is an important source of nutrition. You can see the location of the sheath in this diagram. That's where diffusion occurs. You can see also how zone 2 injury occurs in this area. And then the direct vascular perfusion it nourishes the tendon when they are outside of the synovial sheath and it is supplied by a venicular system and by perfusion at the insertion site. Flexor tendon injury zones. Zone 1, distal to the flexor digitorum superficialis insertion, like the jersey finger, for example. And zone 2, from the flexor digitorum superficialis insertion to the A1 poly. This is the no man's land zone. Zone 2, flexor tendon injuries can involve the flexor digitorum profundus and the superficialis. It's usually associated with adhesions and poor outcome. It is advisable. After repairing the tendon, that should be followed by an early range of motion to avoid adhesions. The post-operative motion protocol improved in this zone. Zone 3, 
from the A1 poly to the distal aspect of the carpal ligament. It's often associated with a neurovascular injury, which will carry a worse prognosis. Zone number four, an injury in the carpal tunnel. Zone number five, an injury in the forearm proximal to the carpal tunnel. And here is a summary diagram for all the five zones of injury of the flexor tendons. And the clinical presentation of flexor tendon injuries. The diagnosis is usually made clinically by observing the resting posture of the fingers and checking the digital cascade and the absence of the tenodesis effect. Passive extension of the rest does not produce the normal tenodesis flexion of the fingers if the flexor tendons are injured. So assess the resting posture of the hand and assess the digital cascade, as you can see here in this diagram. The fingers have a natural cascade which progressively increase in flexion from the index to the little finger means the little finger is more flexed than the index finger. Check for the tenodesis effect by flexing and extending the rest. Normally, when you extend the rest, there will be passive flexion of the digits at all the joints. So if you have extension, of the PIP or DIP joint, when the wrist is extended, it means there is a flexor tendon injury. Finger extension during rest extension signals a flexor tendon injury. Check for active DIP and PIP motion, and you should test them separately. This is how you test for the profundus tendon. Hold the PIP in extension and ask the patient to bend or flex the DIP joint. To check the flexor digitorum superficialis, hold all the adjacent fingers in extension and ask the patient to flex that free finger. Thank you very much. I hope that was helpful.